So with GNSS, there's always going to be inherent error in the measurement. It's kind of just part of the system. So GNSS satellites are far away from the Earth. They're sending signal over a, a long distance and through a noisy medium, which is space in the atmosphere. And so error is a big part of the measurement. Luckily, there are a lot of ways that we can eliminate those error sources. So here we'll take a look at what the error is and then a lot of the techniques that we use to get rid of that error when we're in the real world measuring out in the field. So the most common error sources that we see are the atmospheric, uh, which is really changes in the troposphere and ionosphere, which introduces delay to the signal. This is really going to be changes in the weather. So when you're when you're measuring, the weather is always going to be changing. Uh, so we need to take that into account. The ephemeris or the orbit of the satellites, that's how we know the initial position of the satellite when that time signal is sent. And so if we don't know the precise location of the satellite, it's hard to determine a precise location for our uh, antenna. And so having the ephemeris in there and being able to Correct for that is really important. Uh, multipath is another big source of error. This is really when we get duplicate signals from the same uh, satellite or timestamp arriving at different times at the antenna, and I'll go over that in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, timing, so error on the clock, whether it's error on the clock on the satellite or on the receiver. Uh, obviously, timing is used for basically the, the foundation of GNSS. So if there's any error in the time, it's going to add a lot of error to our position. Uh, the last source is structural. And this isn't really error in the classic sense where we're getting a difference in what's observed and the difference in what is real. So a difference between our measured location and actual location. The structural error or structural error and natural variation uh, is really actual movement that's, that we're gonna see in our structure area that we're measuring. That can be due to a lot of local factors. Uh, and if you're not prepared for it, you don't understand what's happening um, with your structure, it can look like noise. Uh, so we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later on as well. Uh, in a little bit more detail now, so the atmospheric error is, again, the change in the troposphere and ionosphere delay that changes the speed of light unpredictably. And this is really going to be due to those weather changes. So if we're measuring in the summer versus the winter, there's a big temperature change. Or even as the, the clouds move by and the cold fronts come in and the weather just changes, it changes the density that the atmosphere is. What's happening with, with the speed of light is that it's not a constant. The speed of light in a vacuum is a constant. But when we measure the speed of light through some sort of medium like uh, the atmosphere or or water, anything like that, it's gonna change that speed of light. Because we can't accurately predict the weather 100% of the time, we don't know exactly what every layer of the atmosphere is doing. There's gonna be a change in the speed of light unpredictably as that signal travels through it. And so that really changes the observed distance that we, we get, or observed um, measured location, I should say, that we get at the antenna. Well, that looks like a little bit more visually. So we have our, our example of three satellites measuring a, an unknown location or now a known location. Uh, if we look at just this gray satellite here, we have a time signal coming in. So if this time signal changes because we're traveling through a different medium, we're adding some sort of unknown amount of, of, of time delay to the system, then there's an ambiguity in the, the area where our, our location can be. And so this is what the error actually looks like. So in the real world, we might be sitting at this intersection here, but because we're introducing this unknown error, now there's a whole area that the uh, location could be sitting in, so we're not sure where that is which dilutes the precision and ultimately makes it harder to determine that position. Along the same lines, we have the ephemeris error. Uh, again, the ephemeris is the orbit of the satellites around the Earth. Uh, it's a not a common misconception, but it is, it is brought up fairly often, which is uh, that GNSS satellites are in geosynchronous orbit, meaning that they don't move their position over the Earth. Uh, what's actually happening is the GNSS satellites are constantly orbiting the Earth so that we can get full coverage no matter where we are. Uh, for example, the GPS constellation, which is run by the U.S. Or, or the GLONASS constellation, each has around 30 satellites, and they're all orbiting constantly. Uh, this is to get full coverage of the Earth and just to make sure that there are satellites available wherever we are. Um, but a really important part of the GNSS solution is knowing the location of those satellites. So what happens is there are, are services that run these constellations all over the world. They're usually a government entity. Um, and they're tracking and updating the position of these satellites uh, constantly. It's one of the biggest jobs when you're operating these, these constellations. But if that orbit drifts a little bit out of, out of where we expect it to be, all of a sudden the known position of our satellite is different, and then we're going to get a difference in the measured uh, location of our antenna. Uh, so what that looks like visually is we have, again, our example of three satellites uh, measuring one known location. Here, with no error or minimal error, it's easy to, again, predict and measure the location of our antenna. But when we add a little bit of satellite drift to the mix, that looks like uh, a change in the actual position. So we might measure the same delay, <clears throat> and so we get the same size circle. But because the satellite is at a different position, it's going to be a, a different end location. 
And then that error is going to be introduced, then we're going to not get as precise of a location as we would with more accurate or more up to date orbit information. Multipath is another big source of error. Uh, Multipath is really duplicate signals that arrive at the antenna at different times. Uh, it can be caused by anything reflective. So really what we think about is installing a GNSS antenna, whether it's gonna be a permanent base station or more of a rover unit when you're out doing kind of standard survey. If you're measuring next to something reflective like a window or a building or a solar panel, uh, or even leaves to some extent, a lot of leaves can be more reflective than you think and they cause a lot of multipath. Uh, it can introduce multiple signals with the same timestamp and kind of overwhelm the receiver and, and cause a lot of error. Uh, one of the challenges with multipath that is that it's really kind of impossible to predict. Uh, a big reason for that is that the satellite orbit orbits are uh, constantly changing. We know the position of the satellites, but because they're moving across the sky so quickly and there's so many of them, there's a lot of potential for that multipath to be constantly changing. And because the environment that we're measuring in isn't always predictable, whether it's going to be, you know, measuring in an urban environment where there's a bunch of buildings or if you're measuring through the seasons and there's constant changing in the foliage, uh, we can't always predict that multipath and it's really hard to, to mitigate in some situations. Uh, luckily, modern Trimble GNSS receivers have a lot of built-in multipath mitigation where we can kind of track those timestamps and, and pull out a lot of the error, but it can only do so much. So one of the most important things when you're setting up, especially permanent base stations, is going to be uh, installing in an area that's clean and doesn't have a whole lot of reflective surfaces to avoid that multipath in the first place. So what that looks like visually, we have again our example of, of in this case, just one satellite sending a timestamp uh, at T1 being received at the antenna at T2, using that time and the velocity of the signal to calculate that distance. When we introduce some sort of multipath in the area, so something reflective, what we have is the signal. So the same signal being sent to the root receiver uh, or to the antenna. The one that arrives first is going to take the shortest distance, and that's going to kind of be our true measurement. And then it's possible for these signals to mount off of something reflective and end up at the antenna via a different route. And then this is going to be a longer pass, so it's going to take more time. But it's, it's possible for that to introduce some error. So we have T2 and T2, which are essentially the same uh, timestamps sent from the uh, satellite being received at different times. So these two timestamps are not equal. And so we're getting conflicting information about the position of our antenna. Uh, if there's enough multipath, it can overwhelm even the best mitigation processes that are built into like the triple receivers. Uh, and then it can cause a lot of error in a position because we're changing that distance that we're measuring. And for most satellites, that can add a, a whole lot of error. The next big source of error is timing. So here again, we have our example of uh, the satellite sending a signal. We have T1 sent from the satellite when the, uh, the signal was sent and T2 when the signal was received at the antenna, using that to calculate a distance. When we have clock error, it doesn't matter if it's on the satellite side or the receiver side. What that does is it changes the amount of time that the signal is measured for, so the, the time delay. And so when we do that calculation to, to find the distance and ultimately find the location, we end up with a different distance measurement than we were, uh, maybe not expecting, but a different distance measurement than um, uh, that we can use for, for the position. Um, finally, we have some structural error uh, or structural noise. I should say it's not necessarily error. So again, every structure has uh, some sort of natural movement involved in it. So what's going to actually happen with structural error is that it's not a change in the measured location because a change in the signal that we're receiving. It's not an error in the transmission of the signal to the receiver or the calculated position. It's a change in the actual position of the antenna. Um, and if you don't understand your structural movement very well, so if you're setting up for the first time on maybe it's a, a high rise building under construction and everything's made out of, of uh, metal beams and I-beams and it's, it's moving a lot with the temperature, that can be real movement. But if you don't understand the natural variation, it's going to look like noise, especially on things like railways that can move uh, a half an inch or a centimeter at a time, uh, maybe even more throughout the day because of the changes in temperature, changes in the season. This can add a lot of just variation to the mix. So it's really important to understand the natural variance uh, in what you're measuring, especially when we talk about monitoring, to know when the movement is normal or abnormal, because it would be terrible to uh, not understand your structure, measure movement that is outside some sort of tolerance that you need to measure, and then sound the alarms because something has moved, when really it's moving because it moves like that every single day. Um, but now we're just measuring it for the first time and understanding what's happening. So again, it's really important to understand these natural variations because of the, the changes in temperature, the tides, the wind, the seasons, whatever local influences you have on it, that way we can determine if the movement is normal or uh, abnormal. 